what lies ahead. Perfect. Okay. If you think about 2023 and you reflect on where you started the year, what your views of how it was going to be in 2023 and how it turned out, how many of you were pretty close to the mark and how many of you, let's start, how many of you were pretty close to the mark? Yeah? Nobody's got their hand up. You're all economists like me. For the rest of you, you clearly weren't close to the mark. So I don't feel so bad. I don't feel the need to apologise for actually not being close to the mark on a few things. Um, I suppose when I reflect on 2023, um, the, the key things for me is I never expected the Fed to raise interest rates to the level they have. Uh, I expected that, as we saw in many sectors, I expected that the US economy would be weaker than where it is today, given the level of interest rates. And although I was positive on NVIDIA, I never expected seven stocks in the S&P to drive all the performance. And this is what we have. And so as we reflect on 2023, we take some of these lessons and the US economy is stronger than we expected. The US dollar is stronger than we expected. Oil prices, remarkably, are about where I thought they'd be. Um, and uh, when we think about uh, rates going forward, we need to consider perhaps not how high rates go from here, but when we actually start to see rates uh, start to come down. Now, as we go into 2024, inflation is coming down. Core inflation is under pressure. Headline inflation has come down. Um, what I would say is that the easy gains of the deflationary pressures are largely behind us. So as core inflation comes lower, it's going to be a slower decline. That being said, people focus their attention from buying stuff to going out and eating stuff. And unless, except for if you're in China, you traveled a lot of places too. And so the impact of goods inflation came down, as you can see in the middle chart here with container prices, as you all well know. Container prices came down quickly, bulk freight prices came down quickly. Um, and it actually did that in isolation to what was relatively resilient commodity prices. You know, with the exception of oil, which was particularly weak in the second quarter, when you think about things like things that drive bulk freight, i.e. iron ore, copper, LNG. These prices, yes, energy came down, but bulk commodity prices and industrial prices stayed quite elevated. So, and then central banks all tightened policy significantly. I never thought I would see the day that the ECB would have rates at the same height as what the RBA do in Australia. That surprises me. Um, I never would imagine that the inflationary pressures would be similar in Europe to that of what it's been. Now the Ukraine war has been in part to blame for that. But nonetheless, the resilience of labour markets has been one of the key surprises that we've seen. So even though labour markets in the US are indeed cooling, the persistence of labour markets being very, very tight uh, has been something that has probably kept wages higher than what they otherwise would have been. And that's also kept up core inflation. However, we do start to see, and I'll talk about this in a minute with respect to the US, because there's only a couple of, really, there's only a couple of economies here which, in at least the first half of next year, are going to be uh, the key things to watch as you look forward and try and gauge uh, some of the impacts of inflation rates as well as energy. Um, as I said, core inflation is coming down. It's peaked out in most places. The interesting thing has been Japan, where they actually have inflation for the first time in many, many years. Uh, that actually hasn't impacted their central bank response at all, apart from some chit-chat, uh, but it definitely helped the equity market in that location. Um, Weakening of China, I'm going to talk about that in more detail as we go through, because as you can see here in the chart, um, the impact of weaker China on the global growth outlook is actually very important, particularly its recovery 
in the first half of next year, and then the impact of energy prices on inflation. Energy prices will stop providing negative headwinds for inflation around about the fourth quarter. They'll actually start to positively contribute again to headline inflation. And although I don't think central banks will get particularly alarmed by that, because it's fairly obvious, um, it will mean that uh, some of these higher oil prices will start to feed again through into freight rates, into inventories, and, and through the supply chain. And that means, as I said before, the easy parts of deflationary pressures are largely behind us. It's going to be the harder parts, i.e. seeing labour markets soften further, which will help bring down wage growth, which will then in turn bring down core inflation. So let's talk about the US. This is probably one of the things that has surprised me the most, is the resilience of the US economy, and in particular, the amount of fiscal spending that's going on in the US through the IRA Act and so forth, uh, particularly in areas of decarbonisation, where there's enormous uh, uh, tax subsidies and so forth, which are continuing to see companies invest very strongly. The Fed targets 2%. Inflation has come down, but it's actually still quite a long way from the 2% mark. Hence, you'll see, you'll read in the papers, higher for longer. And effectively, we have seen the US labour market cool, but nonetheless, unemployment is still incredibly tight. The labour market's incredibly tight and unemployment is very low. And when you look at some of the forward-looking indicators, um, such as the JOLTS data and so forth, that does continue to signal that, yes, it is softening, but there is an all-out collapse. Hence the reason the Fed has actually engineered, could have engineered, a soft landing, which both has positives and negatives. The negatives is interest rates globally will stay higher for longer. The positives are that there will be, po there will be uh, uh, tailwinds to US growth actually starting to recover a little bit as we go into next year, particularly on the consumption side. I think that's very, very important. Um, when we think about what does this mean for the Fed, um, interestingly, the Fed raised something about a week ago, which Jay Powell, when he was at Jackson Hole, which is a very important conference for setting out the longer term policy objectives, Jay Powell didn't mention the, the natural real interest rate at all. And it's actually real interest rates, that is nominal interest rates minus inflation. It's actually the real interest rate that matters most to all of us because that's our underlying cost of capital, right? And he didn't mention it at all, but in a lazy comment he made at the end of a press conference last week, he said, oh, actually, R star, which is what they, they, they call the natural real interest rate or the long-term level of the real interest rate, actually R star could be higher than we thought. So that means that the 10-year interest rate, while it came back down very quickly to around the 25 2% in the last cycle, it could stay higher for longer, hence they, they, you get the higher for longer comments. Um, now, why is R star higher? Well, it's higher for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the transition economy is going to embed some inflation into economies on a global basis. Why is that? Because as we move from consuming fossil fuels to renewables, at the outset of it, it is going to be more inefficient because we have to make that transition. We have to build grids. We have to build storage. We have to consume energy in a different way. And so naturally, inflation is going to be a little bit on the higher side, which means that um, uh, two things, either, either uh, interest rates will have to stay at these elevated levels until inflation comes right down, or the Fed begins to trade off growth versus inflation. And I think to some degree, while not disrupting their 2% target, they will begin to make that trade off between growth and inflation, as long as inflation continues to come down. But nonetheless, Treasury yields will be a little bit on the stronger side. 
we are going to see the 10-year yield, for example, probably still trading around the uh, fours, yeah, four, and a, four and a half over the short term, and then it will begin to come back down to around the three and a half as we go into the second half of next year. But that's a lot different to what we had forecast initially. Initially, we thought that the 10-year would be already around the three and a half mark, and it would be somewhere below three by the time we got into the middle of next year. Why is that? Because we expected that the US would be much weaker, but the US consumer is holding up much better. And you can see the Fed here. They've made some shuffles around in their last meeting. They now only expect 50 basis points of cuts by the end of next year, and they had originally expected 100 basis points of cuts. So in the end, it is quite possible, in my view, that you could actually end up with no cuts from the Fed at all next year, particularly if you don't get a significant easing of growth in the US by the time we get into the first half of next year. So what does this mean for the US dollar? Because the US dollar has been one thing where it has stayed ex very much on a strong footing. In part, it's because real interest rates in the US have been relatively higher than many other places. Um, it's in part because return on capital has been higher in the US. It's also in part because growth in China has been very, very weak coming out of their reopening for a number of reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so you haven't seen that rotation from the US into emerging markets, for example. So emerging markets have not actually seen uh, the benefits. Well, not some emerging markets did, like Brazil, but other emerging markets have been less, less lucky, and in particular in this region in Asia, um, Southeast Asia has done comparatively well. You look at India, you look at Indonesia and so on, but of course China is the, the big elephant in the room, and China has not. Um, but nonetheless, commodity price, commodity currencies in particular have been under significant pressure, particularly out here in Asia. Now, in part, that's been because of the China factor, but it's actually also the fact that places like Australia haven't had to hike interest rates as much as what they have in the US, which is a function of the fact that Australians have much shorter tenor on their home loans. So they only have a three to four year fixed rate. In the US, they have a 30 year fixed rate. Um, most people in the US who bought homes in the last three, four years, fixed in very low interest rates for a long period of time. Whereas in Australia, those, those mortgages are starting to roll off. I.e. Australia is much more interest rate sensitive. And so copper prices have also been under a little bit of pressure, albeit as I said, Staying at around $8,000 is pretty remarkable given uh, all in cost to produce a tonne of copper is around the $6,500. So even though we've had a housing recession in China and we've actually had very weak growth and China is still a significant consumer of copper, um, the supply side has been tight enough to hold those prices up. But nonetheless, it has led to very weak commodity currencies across the board. I actually think that that trend will reverse next year for some reasons I'll talk about uh, towards the end. Um, the US dollar, um, we do expect that it will uh, be on a stronger footing uh, in the short term, but we think that the traditional longer term drivers of higher fiscal deficits, higher trade deficits, will begin to correct this. You have to remember that if you look on the other side of the coin with, let's say, Europe, for example, growth there is very weak. There's no doubt about that. But the trade balance issues that Europe had when gas prices shot through the roof have largely gone past us. And so the trade balance has improved materially in Europe, and that should support uh, the recovery of many of these currencies. I think our forecasts here are a little bit on the bullish side. I think we'll be struggling to reach 112 on the euro by the end of the year, but I think from a longer term perspective, uh, the dollar should move to a more weaker footing uh, as we go through 2024. Um, now, let's talk about China. There's a couple of aspects to China. The first aspect is that longer term growth will be lower overall. And I don't think that's, that's not really, that's not announcing anything particularly large. Uh, as you can see here in the chart, growth was running around the 7% on average for a long period of time as they, as they came out of the global financial crisis. 
But the challenges to China are such that housing has to deleverage. And we are going through that deleveraging process. Um, you can see here that when we look forward, you can see the contribution to growth is through consumption. Now, the reason why China has been so weak is in part because when housing is weak, a significant proportion of Chinese wealth is tied up in housing. In fact, uh, China, Australia, New Zealand, being a homeowner in Australia, I know all about it, about 70% of our wealth is tied up in our house or houses that we've accumulated, and it's very similar in China. So the first thing you need to do to get the China economy to recover and to rebuild sentiment is to stabilise the housing market. Now, I've been a bit sceptical on the recovery of China through the second quarter and the third quarter of this year, but what I've seen from the policy front over the last uh, couple of weeks has encouraged me that they finally get it and they are doing all that they can to support the recovery or at least stabilisation of the housing market. And I think that's really important. We're starting to see credit growth trough. We're starting to see policies come through, such as um, removing restrictions on buying a second home. We're seeing mortgage rates cut. I didn't realise, but my Chinese colleagues educated me, that if you take a mortgage out in China, it's very difficult to refinance that mortgage. Those restrictions are being lifted. The policy banks are being instructed to work on refinancing longer term mortgages. So if you bring your mortgage down from, uh, bring it down by one, one and a half percent, which is quite possible in the current environment, that has an enormous benefit to release consumption and to improve sentiment. So I think that's key for China's recovery. Um, we did slip into a, a period of deflation, uh, surprisingly for China. Um, that was actually in part related to pork prices. People often chuckle about this, but pork prices have a significant impact on Chinese headline inflation. Um, and uh, pork prices were particularly weak due to the recovery of production after uh, African swine fever. And so consequently, we have seen China, we have seen CPI uh, go back to a positive. It certainly isn't the situation that we faced in Japan. Um, and we've started to see exports trough and we're starting to see exports pick up. This will be very beneficial once we see a stabilisation in Europe and once we see US growth beginning to shift higher again. So um, when we think about trade, I think trade is really important. I think we're at, the, we're at the point of inflection on trade, particularly for your industry. We're certainly at the inflection of trade. As I said, I think uh, we'll go, by the time we get into the first half of next year, there will be a favourable inventory cycle, which will start to pick up as consumers, I think we're at the pivot point of where consumers have satiated most of their service uh, consumption requirements. I think we'll actually start to see a more normal, normal cycle where goods, goods demand begins to stabilise, services demand begins to soften, and consequently, we'll start to see an improvement in the inventory side. Uh, that's the alarm, so I need to stop in a second. Um, okay. Um, crude oil prices. OPEC is going to keep things pretty tight until the end of the year. We think that crude oil prices around the $95 a barrel are about right. Um, why do we? I saw in the I saw in the news this morning that um, that one of the brokers, which will remain nameless, it wasn't Standard Chartered, it was one of the others, was suggesting oil prices can go to $150. I think in the short term that's true that that prices can go above 100. I don't think OPEC would keep the restraint on production at these levels if prices were to go to that. The reason for that is they don't want shale production to materially leg up from here. So I think OPEC would release that uh, one to one and a half million barrels per day. You can see here in our forecast, we have the oil market in deficit of about the uh, 1.8 million barrels per day. So if OPEC was to open the taps, you would find that that market would rebalance pretty quickly. So I'm not frightened about 
oil prices going to 150, but I do think in the short term they could go above 100, uh, but that would be fairly short term. Um, when I think about the other commodities, next year is the year of the industrial metals. Why is that? Because we continue down the transition path. Uh, if any of the sectors you look at in China, the ones that are most resilient and receive, uh, continue to receive um, uh, government support are the transition-based industries, and those industries will consume more metal. As you can see on the, uh, as you can see by the inventories here, um, uh, metals inventories continue to move lower uh, this year, and as we go into next year, um, and the demand for copper in particular. Renewables demand will exceed that of property demand by the time we get into 2025, 26, and that's very important, given we have a flatlining view for China property going forward. The one commodity which is probably moving into a more structural surplus is iron ore. So just be mindful of that, that, um, that iron ore is one of those that is. Anyway, look, I'll leave it there. That's enough from me. You've got other very interesting people to hear from today. Uh, thanks for everybody for listening. Thanks to the organisers for asking me. Happy to take any questions if there is time for it. These are the key points, I think, um, that will drive your views as we go forward over 2024. I think the US dollar, as I said, steps down. I think we finally start to see performance in fixed income. Um, I think we will see interest rate cuts in the second half of next year, um, and I do expect inventories to drive a modest industrial recovery, uh, and commodities will stay well bid as a result, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it.